Hello and welcome to the Discover Virginia Beach podcast. I'm your host, Joseph Trahan, your tour guide to the Virginia Beach area. If this is your first time listening, I am so glad you found this show. Each week, I publish a new interview with locals ranging from musicians, government officials, CEOs, artists, and much more. And my aim is simple. It's to help you discover, define, and then go out and do exactly what you're looking for during your next vacation, relocation, or outing to the Virginia Beach area. And if you're looking to join in on the conversation, take part in monthly giveaways, and get your hands on my custom event calendars, head on over to Facebook and send me a friend request. That's Joseph Trahan. And check out my Facebook group of nearly 50,000 fans of the Virginia Beach area. Don't worry about writing anything down. The links for each episode along with the Facebook groups will be in the description below and also in the show notes. All right, here's the show. Today, I'm joined by the very talented musician, Bennett Walker Wales. Bennett, uh, it's great to have you on the show. Welcome. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, man. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Um, We are in the middle of season two, uh, talking about everything to discover Virginia Beach. And it's only appropriate that we uh, talk about the music scene because it is uh, such a robust part of Virginia Beach. But before we get into your musical journey, uh, would you mind sharing a little bit about... um, where you grew up, and of course, what got you to stick around and build your life and business here in the Virginia Beach area? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm I'm born and raised in Virginia Beach. Uh, I grew up in the uh, in the Great Neck area of Virginia Beach in in a neighborhood called Allenton, and um, uh, yeah, born and raised here. I was I was shipped off to a military boarding school for high school. Uh, so I didn't I didn't go to First Colonial. I went to Fort Union Military Academy, and then went from there to James Madison. And, um, I ended up leaving school so that I could, um, you know, start, start playing music. And, um, so I came back home and held down a bunch of jobs, you know, different odd jobs and stuff. And then, uh, about eight years ago, I decided to fully commit to, to playing music. And, um, but yeah, I mean, what's, led me to to stick around Virginia Beach is I, I I love Virginia Beach. I love I love living here. I love, you know, I love the the pace of the lifestyle that it is um, living down here. And, uh, you know, I get to do plenty of traveling and stuff like that. Um, uh, but but yeah, I, I really love I really love where I live. And uh, so that's what's that's what's kept me here. <laughs> Love it. Love it. Very common theme uh, throughout most of our guests here is we we, we found a way to, uh, you know, really plug in and enjoy uh, everything the Virginia Beach area has to offer. Uh, speaking as someone that relocated here myself, you know, it's definitely right. one of those areas that's very special. Uh, Bennett, would you mind, I, I know you'd mentioned, um, you know, boarding school to then JMU back and forth. Would you mind yeah. sharing maybe some pivotal moments uh, during those early years uh, of where music played a part for you, uh, you know, and also how it kind of influenced the way in which you viewed the world? Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, you know, music has always been a huge, the, the centerpiece of my life, you know, since I was a kid, since I came out of the womb. I mean, I've just, I've always been obsessed with music much to my even my some of my um elementary teachers annoyance i think because they had a really hard time keeping me on task because i was just always you know thinking about music um but you know going from um you know i i mean i'd never even gone to summer camp you know so the boarding school thing was was a big change for me um, you know, I was kind of one of those kids that was slipping through the cracks of the public school system. Um, I just needed a little bit more. I wasn't a bad kid. I just like needed a little bit more uh, <laughs> structure and regiment in my in my life. Um, so I went to Fork Union and um, got that and 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 then some. You know, I got totally all the distractions that most teenagers deal with. You know i.e. cell phones, social media, um, which I guess when I was in high school was still kind of a blossoming thing. It wasn't nearly as prevalent as it is today, but, sure. um, you know, for lack of better words, without getting, you know, without telling a two hour long thing, I didn't really have much else to do up there. So like focusing on music was a way to kind of keep myself um, sane and to have goals and, and to, 
not focus on the fact that, you know, sometimes uh, an all guys military school isn't necessarily a fun place to be. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, for, for a teenage, you know, for a teenager. So, um, but uh, so I've really focused heavily on music and I had, you know, a great support system there at Fork Union. My teachers, you know, recognized that passion within me and really encouraged me to chase after it. Um, one of my teachers, my biology teacher, his name was John Ranson, would leave the school planetarium unlocked for me every day. And, you know, I didn't do sports or anything. And if you didn't do sports, you had to participate in what they called PT, which is physical training. And I would skip that <laughs> and somehow never got in trouble for it, but I'd skip that and I'd be in the planetarium for, uh, oh, excuse me, sorry about that. Um, I'd be in the planetarium for three or four hours a day rehearsing my chops. And so that's what really built my, um, the drive, you know, the real steady rhythm of writing and composing and, and, and all that. So it was a very big, and that's when I really started to dive heavy into writing music, writing my own music and developing my voice. And, uh, I'm still working on that today. Um, uh, you know, following that up, graduating from there, did really well at Fort Union, graduated top of my class uh, with honors and all that good stuff, went to JMU, got to JMU, loved the school, loved Harrisonburg, awesome music scene as well. Um, but I was just like, what, what am I doing here? I, I was majoring in writing and rhetoric. And I was like, what am I going to like, I've known what I've wanted to do my whole life. I want to play music. What am I going to do with a writing and rhetoric degree, degree? like go write textbooks or something? You know, sure. I, I was just like, how to write. <laughs> and, and, and it's not cheap. College is not cheap. You know, fortunately I was in a position that my parents were paying for my schooling and I pretty much told them straight up. I was like, guys, like this is, this is a waste of, of everybody's time and a waste of your money. And I can't in good conscience continue to let, you know, I, I couldn't in good conscience continue to let them pay for schooling that I just, I wasn't going, I hated it. You know, I thought I, I was, you know, um, I felt like I was wasting my time. So I left, lived on the Eastern shore for a year. Um, how, how did they respond to that when he told them? They were not very stoked on it. You know, they were not very, I mean, I told, this was like the first week of college. I was like, this isn't for me. But first week of college, like, you know, I'm sure parents hear that all the time. I'm sure, sure that's a very common thing. Um, it took them a while. I mean, I was at JMU for, I think, like two and a half years before I finally got the OK to pull the plug and go tell the, you know, people at JMU at admission office that I was like, you know, that I was out and I was going to drop out. Um, but uh, left JMU didn't come immediately back to Virginia beach because I just kind of wanted some time to get my, get my bearings a little bit and figure out, develop a plan, um, figure out how, it I, how I was going to achieve chasing after a, a musical career. Sure. So I moved to the Eastern shore and in exile and solitude and um, lived over there for a year working on cars, which was like, the most uh, I'll never work on. A, I will pay whatever it is for someone else to work on my car. I'll never work on cars again. It's, it's very tough work and your hands sure. get beat up a lot and everything else. But um, I was there for a year working on cars and writing music and kind of figuring out how I was going to attack, you know, getting after uh, music as a career. Came back home, held a few jobs. Um, uh, the last of which was like a pawn shop slash gun store. And my boss at the time, I think I was the only one that worked there that wasn't like, uh, I mean, that wasn't like my whole life revolved around like gun ownership and um, like how they work. And it was very technical. Everybody there was super knowledgeable about how the things work, how to break them down, all that. I was just there to collect a paycheck. You know what I mean? It wasn't my passion or anything like that, like the rest of these guys. And my boss saw that and he was like, dude, is you, you need to just go. And I was taken off already enough to go play gigs and travel and stuff. He's like, dude, you should just go. You should just go, go play music. And so I did. And, uh, and that's what I've been doing ever since, you know, full time for like really full time for about eight years now. Um, 
and that's where I'm at now. So that's the, the long short of, of that, of that part of the journey. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it sounds like there were definitely a lot of uh, transitions for you. I mean, the structure of military school to then commute uh, public college to then, you know, living on your own. Those are very distinct lifestyles. Totally. Uh, I can imagine it uh, provided lots of uh, reflection for the, for the writing process. Oh, oh my gosh. Yeah. You know, you go from, you know, from the experience to Fork Union to JMU, you go from, um, at the time you think, God, this is, this is the most difficult thing I've ever been through. But now that I look back, I'm like, oh my God, that was actually the easiest time. One of the easier times of my life, you know, <laughs> you're getting three square meals a day. You, you're being told where to go, when to be there. Um, you know, you, not to say you don't think for yourself, but like, then you go to JMU and you go to college and everything's wide open. You got nobody telling you what to do. Nobody telling you, hey, you have to go to class. You got to, you know, wake up early for that 8 a.m. You know, you shouldn't go out, you know, partying on the weekdays or whatever. You know what I mean? Sure. So yeah. Like, um, lots of change, lots of change, lots of reflection. You know, my I had a lot of crazy stuff happen during my college times, like my being older, my parents got divorced when I was in college. That was a big time of like reflection, you know, oh, wow. it's, diff it's different when your parents get divorced when they're older, you know, when you're, or when you're older, cause you see everything, you kind of see everything a little bit more for, for, for what it is and what's happening. And it's, it was a little challenging. It was, it was challenging for me to, um, but like, it all, everything that I've done, I just, music is kind of what has always been my outlet, my channel. I can, I can use that to fuel. Um, I can use music to get through those things. And that's, it's always been a, it's been the one biggest constant in my life has always been music, you know? So. Sure. Um, I mean, music artist. plays a, yeah, absolutely. Music plays a huge part in uh, a lot of people's lives, not, uh, yeah. you know, down downplaying the events that you went through but sure, it, no, it is a very common theme yes. uh outlet to have and and to take it a step further is is very admirable to pursue you know the music and the writing process do you remember your first uh instrument that you learned to play mm -hmm. well what was it the first one that i picked up guitar when i was really young um but i didn't stick with it i and then i think I think the first instrument that I like wanted to like that I first got into was was piano at the time though like it wasn't as appealing as guitar because and now I'm kicking myself now because everybody you know when you're young you're like I'm gonna play guitar because all the girls like guys that play guitar sure and now <laughs> I'm like god like everybody plays guitar nobody plays piano you know I'd be Maybe I'd be killing it if I was playing piano. I don't know. <laughs> you know, who knows? But um, uh, I picked up piano. I had a really great piano teacher. I just didn't have the patience for lessons or anything like that. You know, I was too kind of young, I think, to appreciate what it meant to play an instrument. Um, and so I was self-taught for guitar. I tried drums. I really wanted to be a drummer like really badly wanted to be a drummer, but one of my friends was a lot better than me. And we had a band of just a, the two of us and we would jam at his house. And it was obvious that I had to let him play, you know, I had to pick a different instrument because he, he just, sure. yeah. he was a natural, he was a natural at drums. So all roads kind of led me to guitar. And then once I got to military school, you know, I was like, oh man, this is what I'm going to focus all my free time on, which was trying to teach myself how to play guitar um, get profit, you know, get proficient with the fretboard and knowing where notes are and all that stuff. And I'm by no means, I am not, um, I'm not a music theory guy. I learned that stuff when I was really young. Um, I was cl a classically trained vocalist and learned how to, uh, read music and stuff, but I've, I can still read music. It just takes me a very long time, you know. Sure, uh, I can imagine there's a lot more technology involved too. Sure. Uh, it's not oh, just yeah. the, not just the chords anymore. I mean, you're talking uh, everything from the soundboard to the amps to the different, uh, you know, the pedals yeah. you can incorporate. You know, electric, Absolutely. acoustic. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. And so, you know, what ended up happening is I just became um, a, a very I'm a really strong rhythm player. 
Um, I only started playing lead well, attempting to play lead, um, you know, a few years ago when, uh, the gig started getting longer and I was like, man, I've got to play for four hours. I need to like figure out how I can extend this, some of these songs to kind of fill up some of that time. And so I bought one of those loopers and, you know, you, with those things are, they're so much fun. Cause you just, as long as you're on time, you lay down a rhythm track and then you can just practice, you know, it's, it's great. It's great for getting your fluency on the fretboard up um, and for practicing your chops and stuff like that. So, uh, but my, my main instrument has always been my voice guitar and uh, I still play some piano. I love messing with a synth synthesizer, but it's totally secondary to, uh, to, to, to sing. And that's my real, like, you know, as long as I don't lose my voice, like if I lose my hands, like I'll still, I'll, I'll like, I'll be okay. <laughs> you know, I'll still have singing that that's like my main, you know, my main instrument there. So. I, I I love that. And I appreciate you opening up about that, Ben. I mean, you know, going through those uh, different transitions, you know, it's very difficult for anybody uh, and including somebody uh, like yourself, where you realize at a very early age, you weren't the normal mold for the systems that were kind of in place for you already. So you kind of had to figure that out along the way. Uh, I understand you were featured in an article uh, by the uh, songer, uh, the daily discovery uh, songwriter, you reference, uh, you know, music and songwriting kind of is like a garden. Um, and also, you know, oh, yeah. you're planting yeah. seeds and, and allowing the time to grow um, during that season of your, of your early start of your career. Uh, looking back, are there any moments of, you know, clarity as far as uh, what type of seeds were being planted uh, during that portion uh, of your time? Yeah. Um, there, yeah, I mean, there, I have, I, you know, I don't, I've always felt that um, everything that I've done as far as pursuing music and and really um to whatever end that might be but just knowing that there were mo there, there were moments where my confidence grew as far as um being able to realistically look at the what i wanted to do in my heart and my soul um which was play music and knowing that that doesn't necessarily mean that means a you're gonna have um you're you might as well throw the idea out of of uh making a lot of money maybe in the beginning you know or sure. forever yeah. you just don't really know you know trying to make it in the music industry is like trying to win the damn lottery you know so it's like it's it's tough um but um there were moments where you know i would um have opportunities happen for me whether there be playing a good show or writing a song that really I felt that I really resonated with that I was like, I was like, you know what, this is, this is what I'm supposed to do. I don't know where it's going to take me or where I'm going to end up, but I know that that's what I want to do. And I, I'd be miserable to, I'd be miserable not doing it, you know? So, um, I, there's a collect, there's a very, there's a collection of experiences that, there, I can't think of any off the top of my head, you know, outside of those pivotal moments of my life that we discussed earlier. And I don't think there was ever like, there's never been like this golden epiphany moment. Not yet anyways. Sure. Um, sure. But I guess uh, those seeds are still being watered in a lot of ways. Yeah. I think they grow your whole life. I think yeah. you, they, you continue, you're never going to be the, you're never going to be the best. There's always going to be somebody or something to like chase after, you know, and that's good. That's good. That keeps you hungry and it keeps you motivated and it keeps you progressing and evolving and, and becoming a better artist and a better, um, a better human being, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I, I 100% agree with you. So we, we're coming out of this phase of, of school, of education. We are more so now focusing in on the writing portion. Uh, do you have any uh, early memories of maybe songs when you wrote them originally? You know, they were still kind of, you know, fluid and kind of figuring them out to a point where you were like, aha, this is this is my recipe. This is my bread and butter. Uh, was, was there a moment for you like that? And if so, uh, when, when did that first come about? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I, when I was younger, when I was in high school, 
and I think it's it's fitting. I think back on it now and I, I laugh about it. But I, you know, when I was in, in high school, I was this very elitist uh, punk rock kid. And if it wasn't punk rock, I thought it was trash. You know, I was like very, very um and you know <laughs> it's funny like here i am this kid is in military school listening to punk rock music and like it all you know it was like st- the stereotype for you know i did a lot of the kids at home were like yeah that's that like bad kid who got sent away to military school and is in a punk rock band and i was i was in i, I wasn't bad but i was in numerous punk rock bands um all through high school but you know as I got older, especially into college, you meet people from all walks of life and they, a lot of my musical horizons totally expanded. Um, I was introduced to all sorts of other music, you know, from friends and classmates and stuff. And my world just exploded. Like I just really, and I I got really heavy into collecting records and I bought a record player. And I think when my record addiction started is when my musical horizons like really to exploded because I just you know it wasn't just about what I was hearing it was also about the you know looking at the cover and having this tangible thing in your hand you know especially at a time when like the digital side of music was exploding you know vinyl sure. was still, you know, now vinyl's really starting to make a comeback because I think people are starting to appreciate those things that I just mentioned but you know um I realized if I wanted to a have a chance at maybe having um a career you know you can i think unless you're blink 182 or one of bad religion or one of these other bands that's been able to kind of break through the glass ceiling like monetarily and um but there's there's only so much you can do in that world unfortunately and like that's kind of the that's kind of what it's all about really when you know um when you get into like the like the creed of like punk rock music and what it's all about. But I was like, sure. also, if I want to have a voice by the time I'm 30, you know, I'm 32 now. And I was thinking to myself at, you know, 15, 16 years ago, I was like, man, I, I'm blowing out my voice after every show. Like, I don't think I could do a whole tour like this, Yeah, you know? So then I got really into, I, it, it's, it was, it seems a natural progression to me now. But I got really heavy into soul and blues music. And vocally, there are a lot of similar elements in punk rock and soul and blues. Um, Punk rock is very passionate. Punk rock is very, um, has something to say, has a message. And soul, blues, and rock and roll also have that same thing, those same elements in in those um, styles of music especially blues and rock and roll um, and soul music, you know, Um, and vocally, you know, a lot of punk rock is is aggressive vocals. I mean, you think of some of the greatest soul singers of all time. Sam Cooke probably has one of the most aggressive voices, you know, out, out. I mean, it's he's he's singing notes and he's not screaming, but but he's you can feel the passion coming out of that noise comes from his face, I guess, is what I'm trying to get. It's crazy. Sure, yeah. that, that sound comes out of his body and out of his mouth, you know? Um, uh, that's why they call so it think, soul. Coming straight that's from why the they soul. call it soul. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. And I think that um, it was a natural, it seemed very, it was natural for me to kind of really get into that music and kind of gravitate. I started writing a lot more of that style of music. Um. And, and then my whole, every, all the music that I put out, you know, after that point was totally different. It was, I wasn't doing any of the super fast, like punk rock stuff. I was doing more soul driven, um, blues and, and rock stuff. Um, and that's kind of been a huge part of my, I I think soul blues, you know, if I had to describe what the stuff that I'm doing now, it probably it's it's a culmination of all those things. It's like a little bit of punk rock, some some soul and blues and rock and roll. Um, and uh, and that's, you know, that's how that's where I, I've landed now, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah and absolutely. And listening to your music b- before the episode, you know, you've, you've really done a good job about harnessing the different elements, um, you know, just 
playing in those different parts and those different roles and expressions really helps, you know, accent your voice. And, and in a way, I think is is really interesting and, and uh, you know, creative considering, you know, with all the technology and music out, you know, it's hard to be a Blink-182 in the words of punk rock. You know, it's not yeah. it's not just a phase. It's a lifestyle, you know. You right, gotta, right. You got to really embody the element of, as you said earlier, you know, it's not just about the money. It's about expressing my voice in a way that's going to help me connect with my, with my inner self, you know, with your soul. Right. Exactly. Um, exactly. And, and it wouldn't be fair to just talk about uh, your struggles and also your, your journey, because you have had quite a bit of success. Uh, would you mind walking us through uh, now um, before you um, went into the solo route, would you mind talking a little bit more about the, um, I, I think you just called it the the Bennett Walker uh, was it the Bennett Walker band. Or what was the band before, prior to your uh, solo journey? The Relief. The Relief. The Relief. Gotcha. Yes, yes. It, it was Bennett Wales and The Relief. Yeah. Bennett Wales and The Relief. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Right. Would you mind uh, unpacking that for us and talk about some of those successes? And uh, obviously what comes with it, the the uh, growth pains that comes with getting a little bit more yeah. popular and a little bit more busy. Sure. Yeah. Um, so The Relief, uh, the relief was like probably the first uh, band that that I've been a part of that actually we really it was we were a very hardworking group. Um, we worked our tails off and we spent the first three years uh, a lot of that like traveling, trying to, you know, playing festivals, playing Sweetwater Music Festival and um, playing Mountain Music Festival and summer camp and um, and playing a bunch up and down the East coast, um, playing some locally as well. Um, but we got to a point where we were, we were, um, we got to a point where we, we had put out a, a couple albums and we were in talks with a, a few, a few people at some prominent, uh, agencies. This is like a month or two before COVID and I think you can imagine what happens next, you know, COVID comes and all of a sudden all those people that we had been dealing with no longer worked at these places because, sure. you know, a lot of these bigger agencies, what they ended up doing is laying off, you know, 60, 70% of their agents, um, you know, booking agencies and uh, some, some uh, management agencies, everybody. And, and I'm, you know, I'm sure that was out of necessity, but that's just the way that things went down. And unfortunately for us, you know, we had worked for three or four years really hard to get to this point. And it was just like overnight, you're back at ground zero. You're back at, wow. you know, having to start all start from scratch and not only start from scratch, but you got nowhere to go because you can't go anywhere because you had to, you had to, you know, stay in your house. Um, and that really, I think as far as the morale of the group, it really was just a huge hit to us. Um, and understandably so. Um, and at that time, uh, some of the guys were also had like, you know, um, young children and um, wives and things like this. So, you know, it gave everybody an opportunity to kind of focus a little bit on, on family life, which I think is really, really important. Um, if you, and, uh, and so, you know, during that kind of downtime, um, you know, a, a lot of things, a lot of things change and people's lives change. I mean, you're almost, you know, it was about two years of, of that. So, right. Um, I, you know, not married, don't have any kids. Um, Different, I, different lifestyle together, different, right? Yeah, yeah, different, different lifestyle. And so I, and, and also I was already supporting myself on music at this point, you know, so I had to figure something out because I didn't have, you know, I didn't have another option really. So, um, I started writing custom songs for people during COVID and I called it the song shop. And so basically the way I set it up was like, people could send me a message or an email and they say, Hey, I want a polka song about ham sandwiches. Write me a song. And it was all donation based. So people could pay whatever they wanted for the song. Sounds and, like the uh, original chat GBT idea right there. Yeah, maybe I, yeah, yeah, kind of. But, um, 
but this this just like exploded and next thing i knew i had like all the local news stations like at my door like calling me and radio stations and stuff it like became this huge story but i was like man i i've it got me into this rhythm of writing i was turning over a song a day and i would sure. i would i would mail them the handwritten lyrics and then i would perform the song live on facebook wow so every cool. night so every cool. night at seven o'clock i would perform one of these one of these people's songs and so that became and people were on incredibly generous in what they paid for some of these things i mean it was i was like i was blown away i was blown away by the generosity of some of these people that, that um with their donations for these songs but it got my gears and i was like man i like i i know i've got something i'm not i'm, I'm not the greatest songwriter in the world i'm just trying every day to to become better you know but i know i've got at least enough I've got something, enough juice in the songwriting machine within me that I can do something like this and support myself. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to, I needed a creative endeavor at that time. I was like, I'm going to write a solo record. So I did. And I wrote a solo record. Some of the songs from the song shop ended up being on this record. Um, I'd say about half of them actually were probably song shop songs from, from my introducing Bennett Walker Wales record um and uh and it it kind of became at that point it grew legs and and i started getting all sorts of other opportunities and i was just like you know this is the universe is trying to take me in a direction and i need to and i need to chase after it and so that's sure. kind of what kept me on that 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 path you know um and i i um you know, I worked with my drummer for the for the relief, Drew Orton, one of the 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 best drummer I've ever played played with, and I think one of the not only one of the best drummers in Hampton Roads, but I think one of the best drummers in the country. To be to shout be out, out, shout out to Drew Orton. Shout out, yeah, shout out to Drew Orton. Um, we've been working together for almost ten years, and uh, he played drums on that on my solo record. Um, we're involved in a new a new project now which we, which we can we can talk about a little later but um um he's you know he's been a he's been a constant in, in all of my musical endeavors since since we met and since we first started playing together um but uh but yeah that's kind of what what drove me to you know writing that record and and start and starting that project yeah that's Wow. What a great idea. And, and at a time where, you know, your back was against the wall, you were alone. And in a lot of ways, you know, your band had essentially had to prioritize other things. Uh, and, and the world itself was uh, upside down as we knew it. So uh, sure. well, thank you for doing that. That's a really cool story. And I'm sure that's what uh, drew a lot of the local news stations in is just something that is uh, very creative and unheard of. And if you weren't a good songwriter before writing a song a day for like a year and a half, then you, Something, you, you are yeah. now. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it was like going to the gym, you know, but the the, sure. the songwriting gym, you know, <laughs> I love that. Any, any uh, favorite songs that stand out to you? Maybe that didn't make the debut album online that that's, you still kind of think about and chuckle or, you know, maybe are meaningful to you. Um, There was one song that I wrote for a guy um, who wrote in and said, Hey, I'm um, I think maybe it was, he was celebrating maybe a year of being clean and sober. Um, and he was like, I've since like um, fixed all my relationships and uh, I'm with the love of my life. And, he wanted me to write a song uh, kind of about these different struggles that he had. And he gave me some references. So I wrote a song called, uh, I think it was called Redemption. I think it was called Redemption. And I haven't played it in a, in a long time. I, I mean, you have to understand too, I, I wrote, I mean, we're talking over a hundred of these things. So like, you sure. know, some of them, some, there was definitely some that stuck out more than others, but, 
not to say that I was like not trying to make each song like, you know, quality. Oh, no, of course. Of course but, not. Yeah. You're writing a song um, at night. You're already performing them. They're yeah, unique yeah. in and of so, that experience. But, but I do remember this one being pretty special because it was about an issue that struck a chord with me, like personally, like all, all of my buddies that I grew up with in my neighborhood. You know, I grew up in a pretty nice neighborhood. It was like, you know, uh, I would say like upper middle class neighborhood. But we had a terrible, you know, wave of, um, uh, you know, the the heroin epidemic and all these kids got hooked on the stuff. And, you know, a lot of my buddies are dead because of because they got hooked on that stuff. And so it was about an issue that, you know, after when you start when you've buried a lot of your buddies due to addiction issues, um, that kind of stuff tends to stick out. So I, and I, so I do remember this song. I, I, I never recorded it, but I still do remember it. I've considered putting it on another, another release, but yeah. And there were honestly, man, there were a lot of songs like that. There were a lot of songs that people were, um, there were a lot of fun ones, like people wanting to have songs written about their dogs, chasing squirrels and, you right. know, fun stuff. But there were a lot of ones that were like, some of them were kind of heavy, you know, and it got, I had to, at one point I had to take a little break because you start writing a lot of this stuff and like you're putting yourself in their shoes. And so mentally it can really kind of, it can take a lot out of you, you know, hearing sure. some of these yeah. stories and stuff like that. But, um, but yeah, that song, that song is definitely one that stuck out that didn't make it, that hasn't made it to a, a recording yet, but, but, but it might, it might down, down the road. Love it. Well, Bennett, thank you for uh, sharing that. And of course, you know, highlighting, you know, this transition to really your, your solo debut. And I understand on your YouTube channel, you also have done a few episodes for uh, at least submissions uh, for the tiny desk uh, with NPR, uh, which yes. is huge i mean that's that's big that's exciting even just to put your name in the hat is sure. uh definitely a step in the right direction and an exciting sure. one at that um sure. could you tell us more about what kind of inspired you aside from it being you know national public radio you know yeah. any uh what, what was that thought process like of saying yeah i want to write it for you know submission for npr um well, let me think i think the i think the first one i did the first one I did just to throw my name in the hat, just for the, just kind of for the hell of it, to be honest with you. Uh, and that was, I, I was, I was, that might've been seven years ago. It was a song called sugar walls. And I, it didn't, it didn't win, <laughs> but I was like, you know what? I'm going to throw my name in the hat. Um, the second one, the second time I, end, and I didn't, after I, after participating once, I was like, ah, you know what? This contest, the songwriting contest thing isn't for me. I, sure. I don't sure. know why it would is, it, it isn't for me, but you know, the more I thought about it, the more I was like, you know, what the heck? Like it, it, it can't possibly hurt. Can't possibly sure. hurt to just throw your name out there. Um, and that contest has grown in entries every year. I mean, last year there were 6,000 entrants into this contest. So like, um, but the second time I did it, I think it, I was just coming out of, uh, the ending of a relationship. So I was all beat up and I was like, I'm going to write this really sad song. And, and, um, as, as, as but, all of us have done at some point, after a breakup, yeah. you got to write it down or burn I, well, something. Yeah. yeah. Poor yeah. girl. Like she, like she didn't know, I don't, she didn't know that I was doing this. And then like, next thing you know, did, did you like, Taylor oh, Swifter? I, I guess so. You, you I guess it? so. Yeah, yeah, I guess I did. And I like, <laughs> I didn't really think about, I, I didn't really think about it to be honest with you. Um, until after the fact and I was like, ah, man, and I was like, well, maybe she won't, maybe she won't see it. Sure. Um, but of course, like, of course she did. And, and it didn't end up being a big issue or anything like right. that, yeah. but, but yeah, the second one I did because I was all beat up and broken hearted and needed, uh, I think I was just looking for something to kind of distract me from that. And then last year, um, I, I entered just for myself. I'd written this song called embers that was, I felt like kind of a culmination of, um, being coming out of 
uh, like this two year thing of being pretty, um, of just having kind of a tough, tough go, you know, I was just like, um, I was just very, very, um, I was just very depressed. And I, I wrote this and I, but I, I had exited the depressed, I'd beat it. I pulled myself out and I wrote this song that was kind of like a reflection of that kind of dark period of my life. And I was like, you know what, there's probably a lot of other people um, that would appreciate this and might also be able to resonate with it. So I was like, well, I'll kill two birds with one stone. I'll enter this into the contest. And also this will just be a new song that I wrote that I can release just just on video, you know, just through that video. Um, And so that's, you know, that's, that's where uh, I ended up on, on, on that last one. And, I think I'll probably enter it uh, again this year. Um, I might, I might get, get a, a, the full band in on it this year instead of just doing the acoustic thing. But I, I think I'll, I'll probably enter in again this year. Yeah, sure. that's awesome. That's awesome. Super excited yeah. for that. Um, especially considering, you know, when you enter anything, you know, you're just like, oh, if you don't win, it's like, oh, I just, uh, that's not for me, you know, but actually it is, you know, it's just yeah. an, an extra opportunity, you know, to, like you said, sure. throw in your hat see what happens, you know, write that song randomly. Absolutely. Uh, Well, Bennett, looking forward uh, to future endeavors and future products is uh, uh, projects, excuse me. Is there anything Mm -hmm. uh, on the horizon that you're excited about that you might be able to share with us in a little bit more detail of what we can expect from you in the future? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Going to record some new music this weekend with, uh, with my new, with my new band, which we haven't, um, we haven't announced what the name is yet because we kind of want to, we kind of want to blast it all at the same time. Although when's this video going to come out? So this episode will, is going to be airing in the springtime of 2024. And then I'll use some of the clips for like teasing the video up. Oh, okay. All right. Well yeah. then I can, I can tell you, I can tell okay. you. So I've got a new, a new band. Um, it's called the Kubatons. You know what a Kubaton is? I don't. What is a Kubaton? I got the name from watching the Righteous Gemstones. Um, I don't know if you've ever watched that show before, but it's absolutely hilarious. Uh, Kenny Powers directed it. Okay, but anyway, I'll have to check that out. So it's so funny. Um, it, uh, but a Kubaton is like a little self defense. Like, have you ever seen? Like, <laughs> you see them on people's keychains. They're like little batons about that big, and they're like little self defense. You can put them on like pressure points or like. You know, they're like so a self defense keychain, basically. Sure, sure. Is it I kind of like this- a ruse, like uh, like it's a gag gift kind of deal? Yes, kind of. Like you can find them at gas stations and stuff. You know sure. what I mean? But I don't know for whatever reason. I like the sound of the word Kubaton. Like it's just funny to me for whatever reason. But this scene in Righteous Gemstones is really funny. If you get a chance, you can just Google Righteous Gemstones Kubaton, and like it just. It was something stupid, needed a band name, didn't want to, we had started writing this music and we wanted to be a band entity, you know, and I didn't want it to be because I'm playing with such high caliber level players that have their own history and their own, um, you know, can hold their own in their own right. So like we wanted to make this a band entity and not Bennett Walker Wales with the backing band. Um, sure. Yeah. You know, and I'm, I'm writing all the, I'm writing the music and I'm writing the lyrics and stuff like that, but it, it's, um, you know, I'll bring a idea to the table and it, everybody gets in on it. You know, everybody's getting on the ground floor of the creative process, but it's called the Kubatons. Um, this weekend we're going to bakery recording studios in Richmond to record our debut EP. Um, it's going to be four songs. Um, and, uh, I'm really, really excited about, about that. The songs are really, really fun. Um, they're really good. I can't wait to bring them to life. Um, the guy that we're recording with is a buddy of mine. We've wanted to work together for, you know, the last couple of years. And finally our, both of our schedules have lined up so that we can make it happen. Um, and, uh, and we'll be playing a bunch of shows and doing some, some touring and stuff like that in, in 2024 as, as the Kubatons. And, and honestly, um, that's, that's good. That's like my main focus. All my attention is kind of on that right now. Um, I'll always have my solo stuff. I'll never quit writing stuff for, you know, songs that'll just be for me, but, sure. um, 
playing music with other people, especially your buddies is so much more fun, <laughs> you know, absolutely. So yeah, fun it's, and it's part of the community. Yeah. It's part of the community and you, and it opens up this whole new world of possibility and what you can do sonically too. And, uh, and anyways, but, uh, but yeah, that's, that's the latest, um, endeavor as far as music, you know, musical endeavor goes. Is that's so much fun. That's incredible. I'm, yeah. I'm, can't yeah, look I'm forward excited. to, I'm very excited to look forward to, you said the Coupetons. Yeah, it's called Kubatons. K U B O T A N S. Kubatons. Kubatons. Right. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Well, yeah. Let us. Let me know when it drops, and I'll. Uh, I'll for put sure. this segment here, and we, we'll we'll ramp it up and exciting. And for those listening Absolutely. now who are like, "Why are we editing in the middle of the video?" Because that's what we do here at Discover Virginia Beach. We are here to discover oh. everything in live action as it's happening. And with that said, uh, Bennett. I know you got to get back to it. You got to get back to writing songs. Got to get back to work. Uh, I, I wish I did have to do that. I've got to get back to doing laundry. That's why we're having this gotta get back to doing kitchen laundry. right now. I'm actually doing my... laundry too. Is this is this laundry hour? Is that just it's how this gotta works? Be, it's got to be laundry hour. Maybe there's a song idea in there somewhere. I don't know. Laundry <laughs> hour. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> There you go. All righty. With that said, uh, we're going to move into our last section here. Uh, it's going to be uh, rapid fire. These questions are quick and fast. You can answer with as much or as little detail as you want. Are oh, you God. ready? I, I guess ready as I'm going to be. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We'll start off simple. Uh, acoustic or electric guitar for just a casual jam, whether you're listening or playing along. Uh, acoustic. Favorite song to perform live to, whether you're copying another song and, and covering them or you're writing, uh, singing one of your own. Um, uh, I would say uh, covering um, John Mayer Gravity. Classic. Uh, would you prefer running on the beach or hiking in the woods? Hiking in the woods. Any woods in particular here in the Hampton Roads, Virginia Beach area for our hikers, hikers out there? Uh, first landing. I mean, it's, you're not hiking so much as you're walk. You're walking, but um, you kind of get a little dose of both. You can get the beach um, if you get you know close to the narrows out there, or you can go on the other side and and hit the uh, hit the trails and stuff. But um, but yeah, walking hiking in the woods is is definitely preferred. Classic, love it, love it. Uh, is there a book uh, or movie that has greatly influenced you in the way you uh, you know write music and and kind of view the world in general? Yes. Yes, there is. Two seconds. Let's see it. All right. So I read this book when I was in high school. I had this this teacher my senior year who was probably the, one of the best teachers I've ever had. Um, very pushed all of his students to really be creative, had so many creative projects and stuff that we did. But anyways, one of the books that he um, had us read was this one. It's called Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man by James Joyce. I had to read this book three times before I really understood it because it's the because of the way it's written. It's written in a um, uh, a literary device called uh, stream of consciousness, which is um, it's it's a very it was a very difficult read, but the most rewarding. And it's long story short, basically the story of it's James Joyce's life but he uses a fictional character to describe his discovering that hey i'm a writer i'm an artist this is what i want to do for the rest of my life a bunch of really cool um references to like greek mythology um like the character main character's name is stephen daedalus and you know if you know the story of daedalus um or icarus the story of you know not flying too close to the sun um, or else the wax wings will melt. And um, anyways, lots of references to flight. Anyways, I'm sorry, this is supposed to be rapid fire. Read this book. This you're, book, you're good. You're good. This is yeah, incredible. This, this, book, this book changed it all for me, though. And I've got I've got one of the creeds. The, the last line of the book is one of the Let's coolest things Let's I've ever it. read. So discovering that he's an artist, he says, I will not serve that in which I no longer believe whether it call my call itself my home, my fatherland, or my church, and I will try to express myself in some mode of life or art as freely as I can and as wholly as I can, using for my defense the only arms I allow myself to use, silence, exile, and cunning. And I've got silence, exile, and cunning tattooed across, across my chest. So yeah, this book changed it all for me. 
Love it. Love it. Right. Bennett, thank you that's for sharing it. that. And thank you for the conversation. Um, That's a great place to end it. <laughs> yeah, dude. Said, thank thank you so you. much for having me. I really, yeah. really appreciate it. This was so much fun. Absolutely. And thank you to our dedicated listeners for checking out another episode of Discover Virginia Beach podcast. Uh, definitely go and check the link in the description below for all the great things Bennett and his uh, soon to be newer, newer band has coming up. And of course, uh, Bennett, it wouldn't be an episode of Discover Virginia Beach without rolling out the red carpet for you. Uh, this is your time to share anything uh, else you might like to promote or any final message uh, for the audience. Uh, the floor is all yours. Oh, thank you. Yeah, no, just thank you so much for having me. Um, I would encourage anybody who's listening to just check out my music. You can um, check out both my, you can check out my previous project, The Relief on Spotify, and you can check out my solo work, um, Bennett Walker Wales, also on Spotify. And soon you'll be able to hear the Coubatons on on Spotify as well. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Very exciting. Thanks again, Bennett.